morning. It's good to see everyone. Good to be together. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's open to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at what our response should be now that we are saved, now that we are Christians. One of the things that happened to me, I was a very... I was raised in a very religious environment and I was taught that I had to live a life of repentance and obedience to the law in order to please God. And so I was raised this way with this thinking that God wasn't really pleased with me, that he didn't really love me unless I obeyed and kept repenting and getting all the sin out of my life. And the big challenge in my life was to try to get all the sin out of my life and to become a perfect person so that God would love me. And so once I realized that wasn't true, that God already loved me, I was so indoctrinated with, with these ideas, ideas like praying to God was a punishment. That's what that I was taught. I had to go and I had to con confess my sins in a little booth and I would have to say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. It's been one week since my last confession, and these are my sins. And I'd have to then confess my sins to this person. And, you know, sometimes he would rebuke me and say, when I was a little kid, I used to do this. I stole a quarter out of my mother's purse, and I bought candy. And the priest, my minister said, do you love candy more than you love God? No. I really do, but no, because I didn't have a relationship. So he would scold me for going into my mother's purse and taking a quarter and buying candy. And then my punishment would be that I now have to talk to God. Now, you, you, you need to repent and you need to, to go talk to God. And he would tell me the prayers that I had to tell God. So I grew up in this mentality that prayer was a punishment. The only time you prayed is when you're being punished. And so this really goofs a person up in their head about a loving God that wants a personal relationship and that he's not mad at you. So what happens? After you, you, you hear the truth of the gospel, that God loves you, that he died for you, and that he's done it all for you, and the life to live is now a life of faith in him and having a personal relationship with him. It's faith and love. And he works in us through his spirit. Well, then that's a whole different paradigm because I would spend hours every week trying to get all the sin out of my life, confessing sins and sins and trying to obey and, and do good works in order to be accepted by God. But that wasn't the fact, the fact of the matter was, I was already accepted once I received Jesus. That's, that was what makes me accepted. The only thing that made me right with God was that I received the life, the life of his son. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, and I realized that he had died for me, and he loved me, and I said, Lord, save me, forgive me, and he entered into my heart. And now it's a completely different way of living. How should I now live? You're used to spending hours a week confessing sins, doing good works. But now that I'm already loved and I'm already accepted by God, uh, this becomes a question. A lot of people feel disoriented. Now, you can be a Christian in living like that, a life of obedience and repentance, trying to please God, through keeping the law or merit or whatever you do to try to make you, you know, feel closer to God instead of believing that you already are, that Jesus already did it, that his spirit already lives in you. And people, because they say they don't feel the spirit of God, they don't think that God's living in their heart. But I would ask you, do you feel the blood running through your heart? Do you feel the blood right now? Yeah, but the blood's in you. <laughs> and uh, the blood is flowing and keeping you alive, but you don't feel it. But the Holy Spirit lives in you. Once you have received the Lord, he lives in your heart. So then what becomes the new life, the new life in Christ? How are we supposed to live now? And so we'll look at that 
Um, three things. First of all, that we should live a life of thanksgiving. This is the new life. It's so powerful. It's, it's so basic that it escapes people. And they don't realize, even the psychological effect, the positive effects, that a life of gratitude in what God has done for you and who God is will have on an individual. And uh, then also that we would rest in the fact that he's done it all. This is very hard for me too, to rest that he has already qualified us. What God has done has qualified us to be his sons and daughters and not feeling like we're unqualified. This is a big problem that humans have and we, we bring this right into our relationship with God, basically saying, God, you didn't do it all. God, you're not that powerful. God, you can't handle me. Maybe you can handle everybody else, but I'm just in a whole different category. <laughs> and so I'm going to have to do this and qualify myself instead of resting, resting in the fact that he's already qualified us and then entering into this inheritance that he's already provided through his death. This is when a person receives an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, spiritual blessings that are in Christ have been given to humanity through the death of Jesus, just like a physical inheritance. You have parents or you have a guardian that had tremendous wealth. They pass away. You can't get that inheritance. You cannot receive. The kids, the, the beneficiaries can't receive the inheritance until that person who made a will passes away. When they pass away, then the will is put in, the, in effect. And the beneficiaries of that will can now receive the inheritance. And the person who made the will and designated these, these, these assets to go to these people is because they wanted to bless their life. They wanted to give you money, assets, maybe commodities, maybe they own some gold, silver, they wanted to give you heirlooms, family heirlooms, stocks, bonds, all kinds of, you know, it depends how wealthy the person was. They can leave you tremendous assets, real estate assets, that basically it'll change your whole life. You never even have to work anymore just because of this inheritance. So spiritually, this is the parallel to the spiritual life. When Jesus died, the Father, we now have this inheritance. And what is the inheritance? The person, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, who then meets the deepest needs of our heart. And we have a relationship with God. This is so different than religion. What the Bible teaches is so, so different. And there's so many religions um, out there. It's funny how Jesus is named in all of them. Now, why is this? Why is Jesus in every single global religion? So you should just think, well, if Jesus is in every religion, I should just focus on what Jesus said. <laughs> I should just look at him directly. I don't need all these different religions and what people are saying about Jesus. I should find out if he's real and if I can have a personal relationship with him. And, and this is the reality. God is so wise in that he's put his... He's put evidence in every religion, even in all over, and it's the truth is in Jesus. And now once you enter into a personal relationship with him, and God's got a way of getting us all to hear this. This mess, Some of you are going to hear it today for the first time. You're going to actually, like I was, I, I went to church, I was raised in church all my life, and I never knew Jesus. I never had a personal relationship with him. And so God brings us into an environment where he can then reveal himself to us. And we're going to hear clearly who he is and why we're here and what is the way that he's made for us to have a personal relationship with him, which is what he desires, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is what he wants for all of us. Don't be fooled. Don't, don't be lied to. God loves you. God is a person. God loves to have relationships with people. He loves to share his life with people, people that I would never want to even know, but God is not like, I'm not like him. So he is willing to. He's willing to have relationships with people, with all people, that will come to him the way that he is made. It's through the death of his son. 
And if, and if a person is willing to surrender to this reality that God sent his son to die for our sins on a cross, that we could never save ourselves, that our sin separates us from God, and only God could remedy the problem. God remedied, it, remedied, the, remedied the problem by sending his son to pay for our sins so that we might experience the restoration of the Holy Spirit that was lost in the garden. When man sinned, God said, you're gonna die when you sin. And that means separation. And when Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit left him. He died, he didn't die physically, but he died spiritually that day. That was, that God, that's what death means. Death means separation. It's like when you separate from your body, a doctor would say, flatline, they're gone. They separated from their body, they're dead. Well, there's a spiritual separation. And this is what took place in the garden, spiritual death. And God separated because of sin. And so the solution is that God would come back into the world and pay for the sins of the world. That he himself would become one of us through a virgin, Mary, he would manifest himself in a physical body so that he could die. He came to die, to pay for our sins, to remove the barrier that was between God and us, that we've created, he would pay for it so that we would then have a resolution, a possible resolution to this problem, which is living separated from God. He resolved the issue. He died for the sin of the world, removing this barrier so that you could now exercise your free will and say, forgive me, save me. And if a person does this, then Jesus comes into their heart. His spirit will enter back in and they will be restored like Adam. And you can see the effects of the fall. When Adam sinned, he immediately was ashamed. He knew he was naked. He felt his guilt. He felt afraid of God. He started hiding from God. He started sowing fig leaves around to cover his shame and his guilt. All of these things are what people are living with today until the Holy Spirit enters back in, until they re receive the Lord and his life. And, and this, is a, this is the big issue that we're, we're constantly facing, that people want, they're, they're, they're wanting things from God that God's not offering them. And they're rejecting what God is offering. God is offering you his mercy. He's offering you his forgiveness. He's offering you the death of his son and the restoration of the Holy Spirit that God would live in your heart, that he would enter in, that you would be born of his spirit so that you could be restored and have eternal life. This is what he's offering humanity. But unfortunately, a lot of people say, well, I don't really want that. I just want that cute guy over there. I'll be happy if I get that guy. He's got a fat wallet. I'd be very happy if I could get that guy. Or if I could get that swimming pool, or I can get that house, or I can get this career. That's really, God, just would you please just give me what I want? I don't really want the mercy. I, mean, I don't understand mercy. I just want what I want. So we want to be like God. That was the big problem right in the garden. That's the lie of the devil. Satan said, oh, no, 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 Eve, if you eat of this, if you eat of this fruit, what was the temptation? You will be like God. That's our problem. That's humanity's problem. We are trying to be like God, live independent of the one who created this world and this universe. And we're basically saying, I will be like you, God. I will know what's good and evil, and I will choose my destiny, my future, my path by what I think is good and what I think is evil. And this is what religion is all about. People, groups gathering together, trying to be like God, trying to get to be like God by their knowledge of good and evil. This group says don't smoke. This group says don't chew tobacco. This group says don't go to the beach. This group says, oh, no, you can go to the beach. And it's just like nothing but confusion. So then I get to choose, hmm, which religion would I like? How am I going to try to, uh, to be like God and choose my own destiny? What rules will I choose and which ones will I reject? What's the path that I think? What will my death, because I'm like God, I can choose. I can choose to be Buddhist. This is what you see people doing, converting all the time to different religions. 
But the reality is there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no man comes to the Father except they come through me. Because this is God's resolution. That's why when Jesus was in the garden, he prayed, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, let your will be done. In other words, if there's any other way to save you, is there any, if there is any other way to resolve this issue of sin and death that humanity is under, if there's any other way, God, you can do this, let this pass for me that I'm not going to have to be mangled and murdered and tortured and killed and pay for the sins of the world. But there was no other way. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born sinless. He is the only life that was ever born. Adam was created. Jesus was the only life that was ever born, God himself, to come into the planet to save the world, to make a way for each one of us, to choose to eat from a tree. They ate in sin. Well, God made another tree, the cross. And anyone that will come to this tree and eat from this bread that has come from heaven will have eternal life. That's, that's it. That's the gospel. There's one sin that's sending people to hell, and it's their unbelief. It's, their, it's not even their unbelief that's sending them to hell. What's sending people to hell is that his spirit doesn't live in you. If his spirit doesn't live in you, then you are separated from him, and you are going to go to hell. Just like you're separated from him in this world, when you die, you will stay separated. And that actually God is going to love you to all the way to the end. And he is going to give you what you've always wanted, which was a life apart from him. Every day he's come to you. Today he's coming to you. And he's telling you again that he loves you. And he's telling you again that he's made a way for you to have a personal relationship with God. And he's offering you a resolution to the emptiness that you feel, to the heartbreak, to the depression that's in your heart, to the sleepless nights with anxiety, with the fears in your heart about your future, about your kids, about your grandkids, the, the stress that you are under about this, this society and our New York State and Albany and Washington and the world, all of these things, you don't have any peace. You don't, you, you, you don't have any joy. <laughs> you, you don't have any rest in your spirit. Now, I, I experience all of these things too, but, but there is a way that God has made where we could very quickly change that by remembering this inheritance that God has already provided. And that's the inheritance. The inheritance is his spirit who provides everything we need for life and godliness. So we're, this is a prayer in Colossians 1, verse 9. And then we're going to focus in on that one verse, 12. For this reason, Paul, for this reason, the reason is that the Colossians have received the gospel. The gospel had come through Epaphras to Colossae. And the people were accepting Jesus. They were accepting the gospel. When Paul heard this, he was so encouraged. And he says, and for this reason, we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you. So now he's praying for these Colossians and, and the prayer. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is what the Holy Spirit gives people, spiritual understanding. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's God. He's our teacher. The Holy Spirit comforts you. He's such a beautiful comforter. When I'm feeling depressed or discouraged, I, Holy Spirit, please help me. Please comfort. And he comforts us. He encourages us. He counsels us. He fills us with the knowledge of God and God's will gives us spiritual understanding. This is part of the first part of his prayer. He's praying for these Colossians to have spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Now, now, a lot of people think, oh, there's religion. That's not religion. Walking worthy of the Lord is receiving what God has provided for you. 
that you receive Jesus, that you receive grace, that you receive what God is offering to you. You receive that, and then you walk worthy of that, that he has done it all. You're living now by faith, pleasing God, by believing that he's done it all. Not, okay, I gotta do all these rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices and keep laws. That, that's not what it means. It means that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to who Jesus is, who God is, and what he has provided, what he's already given you to set you, to set you free, to set us free and into a personal relationship with God that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. You know what pleases God? Is faith. When you believe him, when you trust what he's done for you, that pleases him. Just for you to believe him, to trust him. Adam didn't trust him. Adam decided to say, no, you know, I'm going to listen to the devil. I'm not going to believe. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to eat from any tree I want. And that, that was not pleasing, but what pleases God is that you believe him. Faith pleases the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him and being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, this is what the Holy Spirit does in a person. We increase in the knowledge of God. In Second Peter, Peter said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And he also says in the verse, I think, 2 of uh, Second Peter, that we would come to know that God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. It's already been provided. But the devil, just like in the garden, said, no, no, God didn't. No, no, no. You're, God is trying to hold back from you. You need to eat from this tree. You need to do this. Don't listen to God. He's trying to, he's a, he's an egomaniac. He doesn't want you to know what's, you know, his secret. So God, the devil is very clever at lying and deceiving people that God has not provided everything. God, in fact, did provide everything. In the garden, he says, you know, there's thousands of trees here. There's all, you can eat all the apple trees, the orange trees, the fruit, the berry bushes, all kinds of trees, millions of trees. I made them for you. You can eat freely of all of these trees. But there's one tree that's my tree. And don't eat of that tree. This is, this, this is what God basically said. So you could have everything. Look at all these trees. You and your beautiful wife running around in there. And, but this one tree, don't eat of it. And what did they do? The one tree that God said, don't eat of that tree. What did they do? They ate of the tree. So believing God. Just believing. And then there's another tree that he says, if you come to this tree, the cross, I will forgive you. And I will enter into your heart. So it's the same thing. The same thing Adam is facing, you're facing today. Will you believe God? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing what God has, direct statements about God and what he's done for us is how we enter into relationship by believing what he says. And I, you know, I quote what God says it, to him. I quote it back to him when I'm doubting. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit then changes my heart by believing, by believing what he said. So the pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, the power of the Holy Spirit, for all, pa and why? Because we're going to need some patience and long suffering with joy. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. And then the work, uh, uh, the Father, in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So this now is the verse. Let's just look at this. Um, how are we going to live, right? Uh, Paul's thinking, he's praying to the Lord for the Colossians after he hears of their faith in the Lord. The gospels come to Colossae like it has in all the world. This prompts Paul to pray for them, and he prays for the work of the Holy Spirit that they would be enlightened, that they would know who God is, that they would know what God has done for them, that they would experience this power and this new life through the Holy Spirit, which would lead them to three things when he talks about the Father. And the first one is to giving thanks to the Father. See, it, when you get saved, your new life now is rooted in that. 
not in rituals, not in ceremonies, not in church attendance, not in reading your Bible every day for an hour, not in fasting once a month, not in witnessing to 10 people, none of that. And yet this is what a lot of people are going to tell you. Okay, now that you're a Christian, you need to join our group. And I, we, me, the pastor, yeah, right, are going to help you get all the sin out of your life. We have these programs for $39.95, these classes. We will teach you now how to talk nice to your wife. <laughs> we will teach you now how to make more money and be a nice employee. And just all the list, the rules, the principles for living, that's all legalism and law. And it's actually becoming mediators. These people are becoming mediators. They're putting, they're putting themselves between you and Jesus. Get everyone out of your relationship with Jesus. You don't need any other man or woman. If you do, you're a baby Christian. If you still think like that, you don't understand. You don't understand. It's not a church, a religion, a person. It is God living in you. He will speak to you personally in your living room, in your car, in your backyard, when you're hunting in the, in the wilderness, when you're sitting out in front of your pond or something. Um, he's done it. So how, are, how do you grow? How do you grow? How are we going to experience this? How, as a Christian, now that we're Christians, how shall we now live? If I'm not going to live a life of constant confession and obedience and keeping laws and rituals and church doctrines and denominational this and denominational that, how am I supposed to live? Thanking God. Thanking God. Thanking the Father. Now, giving thanks to the Father in response of what he's done for you by sending his Son to die for my sins. He did it all. No man did this. He did it. He sent his Son. He died for my sins. And I've experienced his life. So my response now is to live a life of thanksgiving. Now, this word, this, these two words, giving thanks, comes from Eucharisto. And now if you... Depends on your group. I was raised in a church that they did the Eucharist. Well, Eucharist is the same as the Lord's Supper or communion. When we have communion together or we have the Lord's Supper or some groups call it the Eucharist because it, it means to give thanks. When we have communion, we come to the Lord thanking Jesus for his broken body and his blood. We thank him that he died for our sins that he's forgiven us, that he no longer holds our sins against us. God is not holding your sins against you once Jesus comes into your heart, once you are born again. And anyone that's telling you to keep on, you know, trying to work out your salvation with obedience and, and repentance is, does not understand the new covenant or the gospel yet. This is how you're transformed. People think rules and laws are not going to transform you. Only the Holy Spirit is going to transform you. So this phrase here, Eucharist, it means in the, in the Greek, it's talking about a continuous gratitude. You're constantly thanking the Father, our Heavenly Father, for what he's done for me. This, is a, this isn't like, you know, thank you at the Home Depot when you check. Oh, thanks so much. And, and then you never see the person. No, no. This is a continual thanksgiving. You mean to tell me this is how I change? This is how I grow spiritually? Just from in my heart, thanking God all day long? When I feel desperate, when I feel nervous, when I get upset, I, instead of looking at this, I look and say, thank you, Father, that you're with me. Thank you, Father, you'll never leave. And immediately my heart starts changing. Within two minutes, I'm not stressed, I'm not worried, just by thanking God. This is the response. This is the new Christian life. You don't need a church. You don't need a building. You don't need nothing. You just already have the Lord living in you. So by thanking him, when I wake up, first thing, start thanking him. And it's amazing that the psychological effect this has on a human when you choose to thank him, you watch the news, he's a horrible, oh my gosh, you feel like the country's blowing up. 
This world is going to be over. Put your faith in Jesus, trust in your Heavenly Father, and begin to thank Him that you have eternal life, that you have everything for life in godliness in the Spirit in Jesus. And if you keep your eyes on these people and you keep watching YouTube and watching these people, you will go, you will be the most depressed person on the planet. So get your eyes off of that. This is the key to the Christian life. It's so simple. It's absolute that no one can take this away from you. You can continually thank God. Negative, negative. Okay, I'm going to thank the Lord. I'm going to choose to believe that God's in control of my life. This is a principle that goes into the Old Testament of worship. This is worshiping, the fact that you remain grateful to the Father and thankful to him. In Psalms 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. God loves when we do this. No matter what's going on in your life, I enter these gates. I enter your... Open unto me the gates of righteousness, Father, that I might come in. And there I will worship you. There I will praise you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength. It doesn't matter what situation. You can do that. You can pray just like, open unto me the gates of righteousness. And, and, and all this confusion all around you. Your wife's going crazy. Your kids are going crazy. And, uh, and you can just say, open unto me the gates of righteousness, Father, so that I might enter in with you. And I will thank you there, and I will praise you there, and I will worship you with all of my heart. I don't care what's going on around me. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So this is integral to the life that we live. Giving thanks to the Father. Living a life of gratitude is a life of worship. If you are non you're not worshiping. Worship is rooted and thanksgiving, thanksgiving to your God, to your creator, to the one who, who created you, bringing these offerings. You're honoring him. You're, you're acknowledging that he's above the craziness of this world, the craziness of your neighbor, the craziness of your job, the craziness of your family. He's above it by thanking him and worshiping and praising him. And it's a continual thing. Uh, yesterday, I had a, such a good time with my grandson, Michael. We were across the street, and I was teaching him how to... How to shoot off these SD rockets. How many of you guys know what SD rockets if you're a kid, right? So he's 13, and so we were spent three hours, and we had, uh, we had seven uh, attempted launches. We had five successful launches, but we only had four recoveries. So we, so we, lost, we lost the rocket. We got a C6 engine. That thing went up about 1,200 feet, and it was, we just lost it. The parachute opened, and I don't know where it ended up, probably two miles away. It was so high. But I, I kid you not, he is the most thankful little boy I've ever been around. He thanked me probably 25 times in three hours. Thank you, Grandpa, for spending time with me. Thank you, Grandpa. Thank you, Grandpa. He kept saying that. I said, oh, you're welcome, buddy. You're welcome. I love you. I love spending time with you. And when you're walking with the Lord, just thanking him all day, thank him, continually thanking God. This is such a powerful psychological thing that, that God, is, if we obey him, our minds change, our dispositions change, our attitudes change, simply by thanking the Father, by thanking God as a response of what he's done, as a response of him sending his son, him dying for my sins, him saying that he loves me, him wanting a relationship with me. It is so helpful. It, is, it keeps people mentally stable. You will stay mentally stable if you spend your day thanking God from your heart, blessing your Heavenly Father. Your, your outlooks will start looking positive. Life will start looking better simply by thanking God. You don't need a religion to do that. The second thing is, uh, he says, thanking the Father who has qualified us, and this is a divine qualification. This is what God has done. The, the Father, he's the one that's credited with your salvation. It's not, you know, me doing this and me doing that. That's what we're taught at, you know, in a can-do country, America. You, you know, you, you, it's about the individual. It's about you know, Rambo and getting it done and getting the education and being this and doing that and you can make it work. That's not the way it works with God.
I'm like this, you know, I, I know maybe some of you are, maybe you're a lot stronger than I am, you, I know some of you for sure are. Um, but I remember when God called me to go to Puerto Rico, I did not feel qualified. I had five kids, I don't have a lot of money, and this is in 1998. And he calls us to go to, to a foreign country, we don't speak the language, and I remember a couple of times sitting there in, you know, early in the morning because I couldn't sleep because I had so much anxiety. Can I do this, Lord? There's no way. I, can't, I, don't, speak the, I don't speak the language. I, I don't know anyone here. How am I going to... How am I going to do this? How am I going to go to another country and, and you know, minister in another country with, I'm just a nobody. Like, how, how can I? And I felt so inadequate. And this is how some people feel about their salvation. They think that somehow they're going to have to do something. But what the Lord then did is he qualified me. He empowered me. I couldn't do it. I mean, I was in a depression. I was ready one day to go over a cliff. I, was, I felt like I was in a fight with the devil. I was in Puerto Rico, and that's where God had, had told me to go. And I was like, you, all I heard was, Dan, you've ruined your life. You, you've ruined your family. You brought your five kids here. You, you've ruined your, your, your ministry, you idiot. And, this is, and I was like, and, it, and there was, I was up on I really, there's these mountains and cliffs in Puerto Rico. And there's like no guardrail. You could easily go over. And, and it was like, ugh, the devil saying, you might as well end your life, you loser. You destroyed your family. And I was like fighting with the steering wheel. It was, it was crazy. It was, a, it was like a spiritual battle. It was incredible. And I cried out, Jesus, help me, help me, save me, Lord. And then it went away. But it was like, kill yourself, you idiot. You destroyed your family. I, that's how incompetent I was. I am. I, you know, unqualified to do something like this. And I knew it. And it's the same with your salvation. People think, you're going to say, oh, how's God going to save me? And, and how does this work? I'm an evil person. God, you don't know. Dan, you look like a normal person. But I'm an evil person. I have such jealousy in my heart. I have such envy. I am a total worry ward. I am filled with anxiety. And these are all sinful things, you know, by the way. If you don't know what sin is, these are all sinful areas. And I am so greedy. And I am so angry. And I am so bitter. This is just a list of sins that we all are, you know, deal with all the time. God can't change me. Oh, yes, he can. Because he is the one, the agent behind doing the changing. If it was up to you, yeah, you're never going to change yourself. But if the Almighty... If the Almighty has extended his hand to you and you are willing to receive what he's offering you, you will be changed, not by you, but by him. And that's really the issue here. You could feel, you know, you have to realize that it's God who qualified you. Uh, someone said that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Now, in the Greek, this is an, an a, the particle is an, in the aortis, which means that it's already been done. It's completed. Who has qualified us? Past tense. It's done, it's permanent, and it doesn't change. God qualified you as his child. The moment you said, yes, Jesus, save me, at that very moment, you are now a child of God forever. He qualified you. So no matter what the devil's telling you, no matter what people are going to tell you that you're not good enough, that you've got to do more, that you, you have to keep better laws. You know, people are really, I was confused, very confused. Oh, you got to keep, well, which rules do you got to keep? You still got to keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, okay, which, which, which one of the Ten Commandments? Well, you know, you got to keep all, no, okay, well, how about the Sabbath? Do you keep the Sabbath? Yeah, no, you don't. You don't know what the Sabbath is because the Sabbath is on Saturdays, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. God says in Deuteronomy, you can read it, 27, 26, Paul says it in Galatians that unless you keep all the law, you're cursed. Did you know that? Cursed is everyone that does not continue in all that is written. And the law is there to show you that you are a sinful person. That's the purpose of the law. 
is to show you that you are not God by your knowledge of good and evil, because that's what the law is. A bunch of laws about being good and a bunch of laws about being evil. These are the good laws. These are 613. So God says, you want to be like me? You think you can be like me? Well, let me help you in your endeavor to be like me. First of all, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Let, let's get that clear, because I'm perfect. God is perfect. And then it'll say, and be ye holy as I am. Let's get this qualified as well. So I'm perfect, God is perfect, and God is holy. And he says, if you want to be like me by your knowledge of good and evil, I'm going to help you. I'm going to contribute into your effort of futility, you little man. Let me give you 613 laws. These are laws you're supposed to keep, positive laws. These are negative laws. So go at it. Now remember, be perfect. And if, you, and if you disobey one, you are cursed. There's a curse on your life. You know how many people are going to church that are cursed by God? They, they're not even saved. And they've, they've been born and raised in churches. And they're trying through their religion and through their law keeping to be saved. And, and they don't realize it. And you say, well, which laws are you? Are you? Oh, no, but we still as Christians got to keep the Ten Commandments. We still got to keep this. You, you don't understand the gospel yet. You can't keep the Ten Commandments. You don't keep the Ten Commandments. The only way that you're going to is by surrendering to the one who did keep the Ten Commandments, who wrote the Ten Commandments, who keeps the law, who kept the law perfectly. So, so what happened? So what God did is he gave us a way to try to be like him. This is going back from the garden. If you remember, the, Satan said you could be like God knowing good and evil. And Adam believed the devil. He did what the devil told him. He took, he took the, 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 he broke the commandment. And so this is the problem, that man thinks he can be like God through his knowledge of good and evil. And so God is helping us, helping humanity with this, with, with their exercise to try to be like God he gives us 613 laws, and he says, be perfect as I am perfect, be holy as I am perfect, and oh, by the way, if you aren't, you're cursed. You break one law, you are cursed. If you are not holy like I am holy, you are cursed. You see what the old covenant was about? The old covenant was a complete system of barring people from the holiest of holies, from the very presence of God. There was priests and mediators, and the entire system yelled at people, you cannot come near God. Bring your animals and slice their throats and drain their blood like I told you. To this priest, you wouldn't even be allowed to go into the holy place, much less the holiest of holies, because you're not like God. You're a human. God created us. And we are not perfect, and God can't have a relationship with us. And when Jesus died, he fulfilled the entire Levitical law. He replaced it with a new covenant, a completely new covenant, whereby it's an agreement that he's made that we can accept and receive. Since God is holy, since God is perfect, if he is going to have a relationship with you, he would have to wait until you become holy and perfect before he would have a relationship with you. And so he gave man the law to let men try to be perfect through religion by their own devices. He, they would then now have the opportunity to try to be like God, to be holy, to be sinless, to get all this sin out of their life through whatever they want to do, meditating, praying, whatever they feel that they, they could do. So that once you finally get all the sin out of your life, then the Almighty can then have a relationship with you. But after about 4,000 years of the old covenant letting humanity see, uh, guys, you're not doing very good, are you? You're not doing very good, are you? You ready to start maybe asking for some mercy from me? You ready? You really want to have a relationship with me? So what he did is and then God himself comes into the world and becomes one of us. Sinless. Holy. Perfect. And he dies by the sinners. 
He's murdered by the people that he created and he loves. So that when he dies, Jesus inaugurated a new covenant that he was going to pay for the sins of the world so that there's only one issue, one sin of unbelief left. The same unbelief in the garden at a tree when they, they did not believe. It was only one sin that brought death into this world. There's just one sin at the cross where Jesus, God himself, dies for the sins of the world. If a person will believe that they're not God and that he is God, and if they'll bow their knee, like Paul says, every knee shall bow. We're all going, if we will do that, he will then enter into our hearts and we will immediately have access to God in a personal relationship with God through the Spirit. Now, this was typified in the Old Covenant. When Jesus died, what happened to the veil in the temple? It was ripped from top to bottom. It was signifying that man, there is a way now, a door, a door that a man can enter into and be restored to their creator and have this fellowship with God and a love relationship with God where they now live in the spirit, where now God meets the deepest needs of their heart to be loved, to be accepted, to have peace, to have joy, to have rest, to have security, to have purpose. All the things that humans are trying to get from this world and so that they could be like God, that he could reach his place in life of peacefulness and joy and security and they're trying to do it by their own works and the devil's saying you don't need God in your heart you just need that guy you just need that bar you just need that drug you just need that weight loss thing you just need this you just and, and it was like okay because I don't have any peace I'm empty we're empty so we we get deceived we go to the, the devil he's at he's at the tree he's right at the cross the devil's right at the cross oh no and he's twisting the message in people's minds so that's what this is about. God did it. That's what grace means. God has done it. You know, we say unmerited grace, unmerited favor. Uh, it's another, you know, not, it's not common, but grace means God's divine influence on the heart. It also, not only God's, in, but my, bet, my translation or, or interpretation is that God did it. Grace is that God did it. The grace of God is that God did it. God did it. God came down from heaven. God died on the cross. God did it all. He did it. He had nothing to do with it. There's no merit. You get to believe him. And if you believe him, you'll receive. His spirit will enter into you. So it's not by works. It's not by merit. You know how many people I meet that they have the grace of God with a merit mentality. They're commingling two covenants and they don't realize it. They're commingling these two things. And because of that, they're not free. You can't experience this. You, you, you could be saved, but you're not going to enter into the rest. And this is the third point here. Uh, you know, it, God has done it. God has qualified us. We, this is my problem. I, I realize I, I had a lot of problems. I have a lot of problems. But this, this was a real big one. This was the huge. See, I had a view of myself that I was real, like I had a big head, you know, like really big view of myself. Like my whole reality revolved around Dan Crespo. And I had a little view of God. Just this little God out there somewhere. You know, it's like, I, I could just like put him in my pocket. And when the Lord revealed himself to me, there was a, a massive paradigm shift when I realized that I was a speck. I mean, this building looks big. I'll use this illustration again, but this building looks big to us. Compared the, the volume of this whole facility, we're tiny. But if you go to an airplane and you fly over this big building that we're in, this building becomes a speck. And if you go into a space, in, into space, Rochester becomes a speck. The whole city, which is huge to us, the county, Penfield, becomes a speck. And you go far enough away from the planet, and you know what? The whole earth becomes a speck. And, you, and the sun that's massive, you go far enough into a deep space away from our sun, and the little earth right next to this, little, the, the sun becomes a speck. And you keep going out, and the Milky Way galaxy becomes a little speck. 
and you're revolving 180 miles, I think, an hour, We're rotating. I mean, I've been around the sun 63 times. I, I, I've been, some of you guys have been around 70 times. I've been 63 times around this little sun. And we're, then, the, the, and then we're, the Milky Way galaxy is spiraling within itself, and, the ga- and God holds it in the span of one hand. Here you are. I, I'm a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck, and my head is so big that my universe revolves around me. And God the Almighty, look at you. It's like, I don't even know why he thinks about me. Why do you even think about me? And you think you're going to get to the Almighty by your repentance and your obedience, and you're going to reject what he's done? He did it. God did it. He created you. He created the universe. He created, and the devil is lied to me. He's lied to you. Not to believe him. No, you have to do it. God did, and lie after lie after lie. You know how much of the world is believing lies, even in churches and denominations and all? I see it everywhere. It's so sad. They don't believe. They're unbelievers. They're like Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses. They're just, um, they don't believe. They don't have the right Jesus. This is what Paul warned. If anyone comes to you preaching any other gospel than the gospel that I preached unto you, he doesn't say, well, they're good people and they just have good discipline. No, he says they're evil. Jesus said, what did he tell the Pharisees, the religious leaders? I mean, you think, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Just read the gospel account. You have the temple, the place where you come worship God. You have the high priest, the leader of the, of the religion. You have the chief priest. You have the scribes, the Pharisees. You have the, the, the Sadducees. You have the, all the Pharisees. You have all the leaders. They're all there to minister to the people, offer up offerings, prayers, teaching, Moses, the law. Big religious empire big religious system, worshiping God. Then you have the people coming to the temple, bringing their offerings, supporting the priesthood. And then they're serving God. So the leaders are serving God. The people are serving God. But then God comes to the temple. And what do they do to him? They kill him. So what does that tell you about modern religion and denominations and all these big... It, that's, it's done away. That's an old covenant idea. Bringing sacrifices to church and bringing up, and this is the altar. There's no altar. Come, let's have altars and let's make this the altar and meet with. No, that's all old mingling. Those are mingling two I and it's confusion. There is a new covenant that has nothing to do with any of that. It is a life in the spirit. It's not a life of living by your knowledge of good and evil, because that's what people are doing. They're living under the knowledge of good and evil. They are under the law. And they're not free to live in the spirit. There's three ways to live. You can live. This is how, look at humanity. I'm going to give you the three ways people are, humanity is living. The first way is they're living with evil. And their attempts to find peace, joy, they are drugging, drinking, stealing, scamming, whatever. Because adulterating, whatever you every kind of lustful thing in their pursuit to find meaning in life, to find pleasure, to find love, to find acceptance and, and security. So they're, and what, what does that life lead to? Sometimes, you know, these guys are the movers and the shakers or all over the, 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 you don't even know these people, but they're elites. And then, but they're evil. Hey, there's the things these people do. It's just unbelievable. It's so sickening. You don't even want to hear about it. And then, but then you get some people that are down, you know, you can see them, they're winos on the side, they're like there, and you can see their life of their pursuit of the flesh. Their flesh, they live by their flesh, and the vile things that these people will come up with, and they do, okay, like all of us. I'm not separating myself from these people, because I'm in the flesh too, and I know. But my point is that people are trying to live by their flesh, to please their flesh. Houses, cars, swimming pools, cars, Mercedes, whatever. 
So that's one way people are living in pursuit of their flesh to try to find pleasure and happiness. Then there's another way. They're living by their knowledge of evil. These people become religious. They're now trying to restrain the flesh. They're trying to find joy, meaning, and peace by being good people and restraining their flesh. I, oh, you know, I don't have a TV in my house. That's evil. I don't listen to the news. Or those people are evil. And they, now they have this whole religious system where they restrain the flesh. These people indulge the flesh, trying to find meaning and purpose in life. These are indulging the flesh. <laughs> These are restraining the flesh. Both of them are in the flesh. Both of them are going to hell. The religious people are going to hell. Like Jesus told the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. They were in unbelief. Jesus, the God, their Messiah, comes right to the temple, and the Pharisees and the set, they rejected him. Just like religious people do today. When they hear the gospel, it just strips them of their pride. It strips them of everything. All you can do is accept God for what he's done, right? But there's a third way of living. It's not through the indulgence of the flesh or through the restraint of the flesh through religion, but it is in the spirit with God. Where you, with, with this, doesn't, this has nothing to do with your relationship. This was the law. This is what represented the law. That showing you by your knowledge of good and evil, you will never be like God. You will never find meaning. You will never find peace. The deepest needs of your heart will never be met through the flesh. Whether it's the indulgence of your flesh or the restraint of your flesh. All this does is breed pride, self-righteousness. You think you're holy. I used to, I used to be the most, you know, I used, to, I used to be a church policeman. I was in a denomination. I was in a church policeman. I used to keep track. I was a deacon boy. As soon as I got that, whew, I had a deacon badge. Hey, hey, I'm a deacon here, just so you all know. And I started keeping track of all the other deacons. I didn't miss a prayer meeting in one whole year. That's pretty impressive. I didn't miss a Bible study in five years. That's Sunday and Wednesday. So this is, you know, and this is religion. This is what religion does. I had no, I was criticizing. I, have, I was unloving. <laughs> I was angry at people. I was telling the pastor, these men are not like me. They're not as good as I am. They're not as holy as I am. I mean, it's all this nonsense, all this religious garbage. And uh, so... What God wants is the third thing here is for us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Now, the Christian life now, Paul prayed for them that they would grow in this understanding, spiritual understanding of what it is to live in the spirit with God, to live in this third way, to walk in the spirit and to live in the spirit, thanking him, worshiping him, praising him acknowledging that he qualified us, that he did it all, that it is not by works of righteousness, it is not by merit, and then we would now live by what he's provided in this inheritance. And this goes really rooted. This word inheritance is a huge word that needs a lot of study, and I encourage you to do that. Because living in the spirit is now living in the inheritance that God has provided through the death of his son, which is meeting the deepest needs of your heart to be loved. This is a supernatural love, a spiritual love that humans cannot give you. Only God can give you. The acceptance, you need to be accepted. People have, it's hard to, to, to even describe in 10 Bible studies what people are doing to be accepted because they need to be accepted and they don't have acceptance and they're not being accepted by God. God might actually be rejecting their efforts because they're rejecting his work. They're rejecting what God has done and instead they're trying to get God to do what they say, to give them what they're asking for and they're rejecting what God is provided and God is offering. So this puts God in a place where he is going to reject you. 
He's not going to accept you. But if you will receive what he's offering you, which is his mercy, which is his forgiveness, then he will accept you. If you will receive his son, if you accept Jesus who died to forgive you, who, who died so that God could extend mercy to you through his death, then he will accept you. And you will sense this. You will, you, he will begin to communicate that he accepts you. And this is part of the inheritance. You're accepted in the beloved. You will then begin to experience this supernatural love, this supernatural ex acceptance of God. You will begin to experience this supernatural peace. People have no peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace. This is his peace. This is a supernatural peace. You cannot get this peace from anywhere else. You need rest. Some of you are in such turmoil. There's no, you're like, you're like a churning inside your heart all the time. The anxiety. You're having chest pains. I, I get chest pains from the anxiety sometimes. But when I look to the Lord, the peace the rest, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, what? Rest. This is a spiritual rest where you cease from your own works. You're resting in what he has done for you. You are believing him. You're believing who he is. You're believing what he's done. You need security. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. God says, I will be with you always. Fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Thou, O Lord, art a shield. He's a shield for you. He is your glory. He is the lifter of your head. Every day you lift your head off that bed, it's because the Almighty has watched over you at night. He's going to preserve you. He's, he's going to protect you. You don't have to be afraid. Let him fight your battle. These are the things that are true of those that live in the spirit. They're at rest. It's not there because they got a perfect house or live in a beautiful neighborhood. It's because of the Lord God who brings the rest. Even if they're in a dump, even if they're in a shack, they still experience peace. They still experience security, purpose in life. They have a purpose. They're going forward because they know what God is. God, because the Lord reveals what he wants for you. This is part of his life in you, that he gives you meaning. You have a meaning, you, a purpose for your life. The deepest needs of your heart. See, God created humanity to live in it. God created humans to live inside of us. Adam, that, and when God left, when he left, that leaves an emptiness and a void and it was only in him living in us that these needs would be met by God because God is love and his acceptance, his, his power would be, would be in us to meet those needs that God by design created us for, with, I'm sorry, with. God created you with these needs. And if I reject him, I could never get them met any other way. But if I'll receive him, if I'll say, yes, I'm empty, save me, come into me, Lord. I accept what you've done for me to restore me with your spirit. Yes, I accept. Then those needs now begin to be met in this inheritance by God. Lord, we thank you. We thank you.